Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. I think it will be a very exciting presentation tonight. Um, my name is Dean Sharafi. I'm heading up system management with Australian Energy Market Operator. And uh, I'm region representative for IEEE Power and Energy Society. The slide that you see on the screen is about our upcoming conference, international conference on power and energy systems. So it will be an event in Perth. And if you are an engineer, you can get CPD points with Engineers Australia. Um, it is going to be a good conference. Please take note of the date, and, and hopefully we'll see you there. Um, but normally, um, I ask people how many are IEEE members, just for um, sake of having uh, some ideas. By show of hand, OK, uh, good, good, good. We, we can do better. So if you want to be a member, I give you a very quick introduction on IEEE. PS, um, IEEE is the largest engineering organization in the world. We have more than 420,000 members. There are 39 societies in IEEE, and PS is just one of them. We are in more than 190 countries. Uh, the publication um, volume is huge. IEEE is the publisher of the most engineering standards in the world. Um, I, uh, PES is only one of the uh, societies in IEEE. You can see there are 38 other societies. Um, if you are a member of Engineers Australia, most likely you will pay about 600 uh, per year for membership. IEEE uh, PES is only $190 per year. <laughs> so, and, and the value you get uh, from membership, it, it's huge. So. There are so many publications, magazines, journals. Um, I, I like Power and Energy magazine. Each issue is really so focused on industry and so relevant to the industry. Um, don't take my word for it. Talk to people who are uh, members of IEEE and have this magazine. So um, for tonight, um, I'm going to um, give uh, the introduction to Ian Porter, uh, my, my counterpart with Sustainable Energy Now. Uh, he will introduce our speaker, Julio Susanto, and um, most probably he will introduce Sen as well to you. So thank you very much for tonight, for coming here, and looking forward to this uh, exciting presentation. Okay, thank you, Dean, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, this is the uh, first time that SEN and uh, IEEE PES have um, gotten together, and uh, I'm hoping that this will be uh, something that uh, will continue. Uh, for those of you that don't know SEN and myself, my name is Ian Porter and I'm uh, chairman of SEN. SEN is a, a non for profit organization that started up uh, some 13 years ago, 2006. Uh, with a group of uh, scientists, engineers, IT specialists that got together and founded some uh, groundbreaking uh, software modeling tools for characterizing uh, electricity networks and particularly for the decarbonization transition. And so this, uh, model, these modeling tools, uh, predominantly two uh, pieces of software that we are able to use to gather data from load, load data uh, solar insulation data and wind data, and we can plug in and plug out power stations uh, according to the uh, amount of uh, transition we want to have at any particular time. And so we can characterize the storage needs, we can characterize the spilled energy uh, and all of that, uh, and it enables the economic modeling uh, of a transition uh, to a renewable uh, grid. And for the first uh, large exercise that we did back in 2016, we characterized the grid of the Swiss, and we showed that uh, in half a dozen cases, from doing nothing all the way through to 100% renewables, that case number five was a very interesting one because it, it actually showed us that we could have a transition to 85% renewables uh, based on a moderate $30 carbon price. 
of uh, a better than um, equivalent case, assuming that, of course, that uh, rules would be appropriate for the efficient transition, um, that we could do it for a, a marginally lower cost than um, business as usual with fossil fuel generation. And so this uh, led us to continue our outreach um, to the community um, and to organizations such as the Independent Power Producers Associations, um, and then led us towards government and ultimately now towards AEMO, Public Utilities Office, Energy Regulatory Authority, Western Power, and of course Synergy. And our exercises now involve uh, trying to join the dots between these organizations because what we see and what we've learned is that there are giant firewalls because each of these organizations have their own KPIs. And so uh, SEN is actively doing what it can to join the dots and help these organizations to become uh, more aware of each other and more aware of the uh, blockages that may exist without maybe even the minister knowing about it, etc. And so we've been uh, lobbying in a, in a progressive, uh, positive sense. And this has uh, largely worked because uh, last year, as you probably were aware, we made it a mandate at our uh, annual general meeting that we wanted to see a planning uh, exercise. And when the new minister came in, uh, Minister Johnson, first thing that he did was he became aware of these, these needs and the planning exercise of the DER roadmap and the, uh, the WASP, the uh, whole of system plan, has been announced and that is now being undertaken by the uh, Public Utilities Office with the support of AEMA. So um, before I, I, that really is an introduction to SEN, uh, you're welcome to join SEN if you wish. If you're not a member already, we welcome you and we also welcome the volunteers that could come from, uh, from the public domain, of particularly engineering people that have experience in, uh, in grids, uh, in power generation systems. This would be very useful for us. So, um, in introducing our first speaker tonight, um, who happens to be a relative of uh, a very good friend of mine, and we only found out just a few weeks ago, I happened to ask him, do you know anybody called Arif Susanto? He said, I do, he's my brother <laughs> in Indonesia, and who I, I know very well and actually work for for a period of time. Um, so, Julius is going to be talking about the subject of inertia. Now, in my background in power generation in the past, we always knew that inertia existed, but we didn't actually th it didn't actually register. It was a it was a byproduct that was always there, because all of the generation in my early days was all rotary generation, and so inertia was just there. You didn't think about it too much. Of course, nowadays when we see solid state devices taking over generation in the form of inverters um, and other devices such as wind turbine generators of certain types that um, are not directly connected to the network, they're connected through electronics, uh, you see the ability for inertia to be affected. So uh, inertia is all around us, it's in our human body, it's in the atmosphere, it's all around. And uh, going back to Galileo, who was the first uh, individual that characterized or uh, defined in inertia, uh, through uh, Newton's first law of motion, and then ultimately uh, the creation of induction generation, induction uh, synchronous generation. And who could have known back in those days, I'd love to, have, to go back in time and, and ask uh, Tesla and uh, the likes of uh, Tesla and uh, Edison and uh, Faraday and Kelvin, you know, uh, could you imagine a future where the whole grid would be one revolving mass? <coughs> They, they probably didn't think too much about it in those days, that one day that would all disappear and we become solid state. And ultimately the potential to do that is there. So in, in uh, looking at this, it, we see a fascination for uh, involving ourselves in the transition and to tell us all about these, uh, these issues that we'll be featuring in our network. Uh, I'll introduce Julius and uh, reserve your questions for uh, afterwards. We'll have a Q&A. <coughs> And uh, so, please uh, put your hands together for Julius Sasanto. Thanks, Ian, and thanks, Dean, for the introduction. Yeah. As it happens, I'm a member of both RPPS and, and SEN, so that works out well. Um, so, if, I'll just disclaim to begin with that although I work for AEMO, some of these opinions 
are my own, and so they don't necessarily reflect the, the, the official position of AIMO. So if you get only one thing out of this presentation, is the idea that inertia is energy. And specifically, it's the kinetic energy stored in the rotating masses of synchronous and, and fixed speed induction machines. And uh, I'm putting a little note there for any pedants that um, you know, variable speed wind turbines or induction machines, while they actually have inertia, they don't provide an inertial response. And we'll talk about that a little bit um, later on. So, oops. So the bigger and the heavier the rotating mass, the more inertia that it has. So you imagine this is a, a steam turbine um, shaft, and you can imagine that just spinning around and how much energy that it's in there, how much it would take for you to, to stop it if it was in full motion. So the, the, the mass and the size of the uh, machine has a lot to do with the inertia that's in the, in, in the machine. However, there are, are devices that are like static devices, like solar inverters, that have no inertia. And this is sort of the, uh, the topic going forward here is um, we're having more and more of these sort of uh, zero inertia devices connected to our grid. So progressively, the, the inertia in the Swiss is actually decreasing with the growth of rooftop solar primarily. There's, there's more than 1,100 megawatts, I think, now, um, of rooftop solar. As well as there's new utility wind and PV uh, farms being connected. So by the end of next year, there'll be more than 550 megawatts uh, connected to the system. And just as a, um, a point of reference, the typical inertia range in, in the Swiss is, is between uh, 12,500 and 17,000 megawatt seconds. Now, megawatt seconds is the, 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 how we um, measure inertia, and if, if you are a keen observer, then megawatt seconds is actually joules or megajoules, which is energy. So our concept again of inertia as energy, we'll keep coming back to that. The maximum inertia in the system is about is 24,722 megawatt seconds. Okay, last year. Well, to be fair, it's probably higher than that because we've only been measuring inertia for the last couple of years. But the interesting point is that here the minimum inertia, it's uh, 9,802 megawatts, and it occurred during the day, so 10:20 a.m. on a December day. So these are the last two years of inertia um, as a histogram, and you can see it's not symmetrical. So um, most often it's in this region, this 12,500 to 17,000 region. Sometimes it's, lar it's large, and sometimes it's uh, quite small. And what you also notice is lumpy. And, and this is because um, inertia occurs in chunks. So we put on a generator, and you get 500 megawatt seconds. You know, we don't get these, this nice, smooth um, curve of inertia along the system. That's why you end up with these sort of lumpy, lumpy chunks there. So I can't have a presentation about inertia about the duck curve. And so here's, here's the duck curve uh, as it's evolving over the time and into the future. So the first couple of years are uh, historical, and then the next couple of years are, um, are uh, sort of projected forwards. And, and what you can see here is this hollowing out in the middle here uh, where rooftop solar is coming in and the loads are becoming very low. And the problem with this is that when the loads get lower, the rooftop solar is actually displacing synchronous machines, or the machines that have rotating inertia. And so the, the, the sort of characteristics of a really low inertia day. This is, by the way, is the minimum day of the year, of that year, particular year in the Swiss. Anyway, the characteristic for a low inertia day is usually it's a weekend. So you have lower load uh, during the weekend, you have less uh, commercial and industrial activity. It's usually in the shoulder season. So the interesting point here is that this is the period where we usually have the major outages for maintenance of the large uh, plants in the system. So the big coal units of Muja and, and Colli, um, the large combined cycle units at uh, Nugen, Kunana and Coburn. And, and they have large inertia. You, you take them out of the system because they're basically on maintenance and we reduce the, the total amount of system inertia. Thirdly, you have mild temperatures, so basically you don't need any heating or cooling. 
at the residential level. So people don't use that much power. So your load goes even lower. And lastly, it's a clear sky day. So your maximum penetration of PV in the system. This was on Saturday, last this past Saturday. Um, and you can see, if you remember Saturday, it was a lovely day. And it was a weekend day, and it was sort of associated with Anzac Day, so there was a, there was a um, sort of a holiday feel to it as well. And, and you can see here that our load went down a touch below 1,500 megawatts. But here is the rooftop solar. So our native load is actually more than 2,000 megawatts throughout the day. But because of rooftop solar um, taking out that chunk in the middle, we, we've gone down. And um, you can see this is the, the fractions of, um, of, of solar versus scheduled generation, which is all the thermal generation, and this is mainly wind down the bottom here. So at, at the midday, you can see that solar was 20, 22, 23% of the load, if not more. So I've talked about inertia, and I'll talk about sort of the operational impacts of what does, what does low inertia mean, and how does that affect, affect uh, our system? So it's a bit of life theory, um, trying to make it as, as uh, accessible as possible though. So we've, we've said that inertia is energy, but it is actually an energy that's exchanged with the system whenever there's an instantaneous mismatch in generation and load. It's a bit of a mouthful, so let's go through some, some examples. So if load was greater than generation, that means you have a power deficit in the system. All that kinetic energy from those rotating masses, they supply that energy deficit. But in doing so, the rotation of the machine slows down. And as a result, frequency goes down, because frequency is pretty much connected with the, the speed of rotation. Conversely, if you have more generation than load, then you have excess energy, and that's converted into kinetic energy, and the machine starts speeding up, and your frequency goes up. And, and obviously, the, the, the last case is um, when generation equals load, there's no inertial energy exchange and your system frequency is stable. Nice 50 hertz, that's what we want. This is the classical analogy for inertia, which is a tank of water, where the inertia is basically all the water in the tank. You have a, a tap with, or a hose rather, with generation filling it up with water, and you have a tap with load, with water's coming out. And uh, it frequencies the water level. So basically, if your generation and your load are absolutely matched, You've got enough water coming in and the same amount of water coming out, and then your frequency is going to just stay as it is. Um, should point out that load is, is net of losses as well, so it includes losses in the system. So what happens if generation suddenly switches off? So inertia here is basically all the water in the tank, and it's, it's, that's, that's the energy that's being used to supply the loads. The loads are still being supplied, but they're being supplied from rotating masses, and as a result, frequency starts dropping. Now, what happens if we have a, oh, here we go, it's just a bit of a, yep, energy from inertia supplies load, we've talked about that. Now, what happens if um, the tank was smaller? And you can see here that it drains faster, and that is one of the key insights here of, uh, of inertia, is that the less inertia you have in the system, you have less energy in the rotating masses, and frequency drops more rapidly. And the conclusion then is that the amount of system inertia affects the rate of change of frequency. So that, that's an important term that we, we often use called, we say, rock off. And um, what we, the implication is that low inertia systems have a higher rock off. And as a result, they actually, small changes in, in small mismatches in power and, uh, and load, or generation and load, gives a more volatile frequency, so it's much more um, sensitive to frequency variations. So inertia and contingency. So this is the second big piece here, is um, a contingency, if you don't know, is basically any undesired system event. So we, we could be a generator just tripping off the system. Um, we didn't want it to happen, but it happened. Or it could be a load coming off, or you know, lightning striking a tower, and then tower, tripping, load coming off. That, that's a contingency. When I say contingency here, I'm really mainly talking about a generator contingency. So here we have, on this axis, the change in active power, and this is just time. And so at some point, we're humming along 50 hertz, 
and then all of a sudden we lost all this generation. This is a negative change here. So this could be like 200 megawatts. We've just lost that in, uh, in, in a split second. So what happens in the first instant after we lose a generator? The inertial response comes in. So this is where all the uh, other generator masses come in and supply that energy. So that energy there, or that power there, is the same as that power there being supplied. But as a result, frequency starts going down. Yeah, that's what we just described before. Now, if we just had inertia, what would happen? Frequency would go to zero, you'd have a blackout, because you'd just run out of energy from the rotating masses. They'll just slow to a standstill, and then we get nothing. So what we actually need is, a, we need a thing called primary response. So this is all other generating units, they start ramping up their power. And what this does in the first, was primary response really in the first 20 odd seconds. And what that does is it, uh, it settles the frequency to, or to a frequency nadir. Sometimes it's called containment reserves, frequency containment. And, uh, and that settles out at, at some frequency. This frequency is not 50 hertz, as you can see. What you need then is something called secondary reserves, uh, which brings it back to the normal operating band, the 49.8 hertz. And then after that, you have normal, really normal operation. You, you re-dispatch or rebalance all the other generations. So you, you basically uh, get, get all that energy back from um, rejigging re all the generation in the system. So we can draw like the total response of the system. And um, here's a real event. And you can see that the response is, is kind of like that. You have an inertial response and you have a, uh, <coughs> a primary response and some secondary response. I didn't show the, the balancing because this, this event was pretty much over in 20 seconds. So these are all automatic. So you can see uh, this is a 200 megawatt generator dropping off in this case. Um, we had a rock off here of 0 0.3 hertz per second, a frequency nadir of 49.48 hertz, but then it recovered very quickly and, and we were all done in 20 odd seconds. So we go back to this idea of inertia and continuities. Now, what happens if. Um, we had a lower inertia. So we had a lower inertia, we had actually less energy here under the curve here. So what happens is we get end up with a higher rock off as described. We also end up with a lower nadir um, in, in the system. So um, here's a some simulated sort of curve. This is pretty hypothetical, so don't take thing too too much stock of the, the numbers here. Um, so it's not, not real. Um, but you can really do see that when you have very low inertia, you have a very high rock off. So it drops off very quickly. And the frequency nadir, or the minimum frequency, is also much lower. And they, they steadily go up, and it's steadily, uh, the, the rock offs start going down as you increase the amount of inertia in the system. So the second conclusion here is that the amount of inertia really does affect both the rock off and the frequency nadir and that low inertia systems have both uh, higher rock offs and lower frequency nadirs. And that, that's an important point. So here's just a summary of the, the operational implications and the risks that are associated with um, having uh, low inertia. So we have um, the risk of having a low frequency nadir is that we have a increased system security risks after we have a generator dropping off the system. So what that means is we can risk under frequency load shedding. So that's basically a protection system in the system that if the frequency goes down too uh, far, it will just drop off gener uh, load in the system. Well, it's a load shed. So we would knock off a few loads in a couple of suburbs or whatever, and um, that, that's supposed to get the power back to balance. Where Because we've lost 300 megawatts, then we need to gain that 300 megawatts back somehow. And if the frequency falls too far, then you can try and get power balance by um, knocking out the, frequency, uh, the loads, I mean. And, and, the, and the other risk is that we can have a system black event, a blackout, which is basically what happened in, in South Australia. So South Australia, if you remember, in 2016, they had a couple of tornadoes, hit a few lines, and um, took out those lines happened to take out a few wind generators, there were some protection issues with the wind generators and, and they went off and then that overloaded the, the interconnector from Victoria and then that one 
went off and basically you just had a lot of load and not much generation. So the frequency went down very quickly and uh, blacked out the whole system. And, and that's, a, that's the risk uh, of, of, uh, of that kind of event. Um, and it's a low, it was a low inertia system because once it was islanded, there wasn't that much generation in South Australia itself. It was a very low inertia system. Now the risk of having higher rock off is that obviously you have high variation system frequency. So we're talking about it's much more volatile to system frequency. And so we would need faster frequency control and, um, and regulation and load follow. And there's a risk also actually that Uffles just doesn't work because you're just going so fast through the Uffle stages that as soon as you hit the first stage, you're already going through to the second and the third stage. And so by the time the first uh, stage knocks out some loads, uh, you're already black. So that, that's, a, that's another risk here that when you have your rock-offs too fast, that happens. And again, in South Australia, uh, they had something like three hertz per second or something, um, rock-off, so that, that went, the uffles didn't work, put it that way. They have uffles and they didn't work, so it went black. So that was a bit of scaremongering there, and now we're just going to talk about how, you know, how, how we operate in such a grid um, uh, within a low inertia grid. So I'm just going to introduce this concept, and we're just going to keep reusing it. So um, we, we, I've got rid of the secondary and the, the tertiary elements, so just, we're just concentrating on that, the, the inertia and the primary response, because really it all happens in this, in this section here. Um, and what happens is that there's, there's actually an energy gap here. So the reason why the frequency falls is because if you, if you actually recovered all of that generator contingency, you recovered all the energy very quickly, frequency just be, be stable, just be 50 hertz. You have inertia and you have the primary response, but you actually have a gap here of energy. And that gap there basically determines how much you fall and how much uh, the nadir is. And so what happens when you have lower inertia is, um, but the same primary response, you, you can sort of gather here, you're going to have a bigger gap. And, and that causes this larger frequency deviation here. And that's really the, that's really the basis of the whole, all this stuff. It's really just about energy and energy um, replacement after a generated continuity. So, uh, in that case then, what happens if we have the same lower inertia, but we had a really fast and a high amount of primary response? Then that gap would be pretty small, right? And so as you'd expect, frequency deviation would be also very small as well. So um, that leads me to this next point. There's actually trade-offs here between how much inertia we have in the system and the quantity of the primary response and how fast we want to, uh, we want to um, exercise that primary response. So we consider that primary response to be a, some kind of linear ramp. So where you have a ramp and then it goes up to its, its uh, quantity value and it ramps up at a certain time. We call that the, the ramp time and it has a quantity, primary frequency response quantity. Then there is this trade-off between inertia and primary response quantity. So we had a fixed ramp time here is the, um, well you can't really see it here, but here's the, on this axis is how much primary response quantity you need, and this is how much inertia you need. But you can see the shape of the curve, and basically, as you can see, when inertia is very low, here's 2,000 megawatt seconds, uh, for a 300 megawatt contingency, you need something like 3,000 megawatts to recover that at six seconds. So I mean, that, that's obviously crazy, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't, we wouldn't provision that. That's just a, a nutty way to do it. But as you have more inertia, you have 16,000, you basically need here less than 300. This is something like 200 or something. Um, the other trade-off is actually ramp time. So um, if we had just 240 megawatts of quantity, what is the ramp time that we need to, um, to, to, to keep the frequency you know, above its, its required level? And what we find is that... Um, at very low inertia, you need to ramp up very fast. So here is less than a second. It's like half a second here. But as you, you get out to more higher inertias, you can have a ramp time here of six seconds there. Five and a half, six seconds. So um, that 240 probably corresponds to that, that value there, actually, at 16,000. So um, they're the two 
trade-offs that you have. So uh, we take it to the nth degree. What happens if we went, you know what, let's, let's put a really fast, really high capacity in, like a massive battery that completely covers the energy lost. Let's do that, all right? See what happens. What, you, what would you expect is you'd expect basically just very sharp transient voltage spike down and then frequency is just maintained very nicely. Now you might be asking, is this worth it, <laughs> right? Because in order to do this, we would need to have something like this uh, on standby. And the market cost of keeping something like that on standby, you know, it'd be, I imagine it'd be pretty expensive. And, um, but you know, maybe not in the future, if you could aggregate this from small batteries. I don't know. There's also some potential difficulties in controlling and, and triggering. How, how do you control something like this to, to operate at, a, at the right level and the right speed and so forth? I think GE's got, come, got some ideas on how they would do it. Um, they've, they've got a few papers out. And, and I think this is a surmountable problem technically. So you could probably do it. But maybe the most efficient way is to find a primary response with the least amount of energy use. Because remember, this is fully recovering that energy. We could probably do something like that with less energy, still do the same thing. We won't get the same pre frequency performance, but we won't get affles and we won't get all these other problems that we have associated with this. Just food for thought, really. So um, the other thing I want to say, so we talked about the inertia ramp, uh, the primary response ramp time and the quantity. The, the next thing I want to talk about is um, how inertia and contingency size are, reflect, uh, are affected. So um, we've gone back to the same picture again. We have lower inertia, but rather than having um, that contingency size here, we have a smaller one. And so um, this is the same inertia, but because it doesn't require, this, it has, you know, it requires less power to recover in the in first instance, that area under the curve is the same, but you, can, you get more of it you get over time. And so you, you have a better frequency response. So the conclusion there is that um, there's a trade-off between inertia and contingency size. So you can lower your contingency size at lower inertias to give you um, better response with the same amount of primary response that you have, all things being equal. So here's a, here's a plot here. Uh, we have a 300 megawatt contingency here, and, and we need 3,000 odd here at 2,000 megawatt seconds inertia. If you reduce that contingency to 200 megawatts, you only need about 1,000. So the differences are, can be very high at very low inertia values. However, in, in the, our system, in the WEM, the largest contingency is often determined by, uh, by market mechanisms. So and there's, a, there's a, only a few instances where we can control the size of the contingency. Um, so it's determined by market clearing mechanisms. But, you know, in the future it could be that we have a, a, a minimum inertia or maximum contingency size constraint that is applied to the system to, to maintain uh, security. So yeah, virtual inertia. So as we've discussed, as we've just discussed, you know, inertia is essentially just a very fast energy injection at zero seconds, um, and in response to an imbalance between generation and load. Now, these power electronic devices can mimic this same behaviour, but pro and provide a virtual inertia. You basically have a battery or a or a, uh, um, a wind turbine with with some headroom, and you can inject that power in very quickly. It requires a software change though, to the control systems of these, these inverters, but you could technically do it, and um, it's sometimes referred to as synthetic inertia or you know, sometimes fast frequency response as well. Now, um, this, is a, this is up for discussion, possibly a bit contentious. Should this be a requirement for new generators or should this uh, be market-driven? Market it is a question for, um, for, for us to discuss. So here's a recap for how we, we operate the system with um, low inertia. Is, uh, here are our current operating mechanisms for how we manage the system. So this is from our um, AEMO or system management sort of perspective here. We can either increase the quantities of the primary response, we can speed up the ramp rate of all these responses or, or you know, provision machines that are fast acting, um, or you know, add batteries and so forth. Or we can um, decrease the largest contingency size. So, 
the, they're sort of the, the levers that we can pull right now. But going into the future, what can we do? I mean, these are sort of more technological um, options as, as they unfold over time. We can um, add condensers into the system, which um, are basically synchronous machines that, um, that have no load or generation connected to them, uh, prime movers, I mean. And, and that could be simply a, re a retrofit of a mothballed, existing mothballed generator. That's possible. Uh, and that provides inertia and also provides voltage support, which is nice. Um, you can have grid scale energy storage systems that provide the, this virtual inertia or the fast frequency response, which is essentially what the, the Hornsdale Power Reserve in, in South Australia is, um, among other things. You could do that at the distributed level, or you could have distributed demand response, and that's all, also possible. Or you could, um, you know, I'm, I'm now I'm just really reaching here, but you can um, have sort of voluntary load shedding of microgrid clusters, for example, if, you know, we're going further out to the future where uh, suburbs are, can be connected together as microgrids. You know, if there's an event, they could disconnect off the grid, they could maintain their own grid and run them autonomously, and they could save the system at the same time by disconnecting the load at the, at the point when it's required. So uh, now I'm just going to talk quickly about some tools that we're, we've deployed in, in uh, AMO um, to, uh, to, to monitor and to sort of manage inertia. So the first um, tool is an is inertia monitoring tool. So this is a real-time tool where we are actually um, looking at the inertia of all the generators, which is on the um, y-axis, and we plot that against the largest contingency. So these big bubbles here are where the inertia is at right now. And this is a trajectory over the last day. And so the green ones are during the, the daytime periods, um, the yellow is in the morning, and um, this is sort of evening peak and night. And as you can expect, evening peak is when you have the most inertia because you have most of the generation on during the evening peaks. Yeah? So, uh, and it's really at the night, this time here, where you have the lowest amount of inertia. And, and sometimes during the day as well when we have a lot of solar penetration. Uh, this is a tool that we've been building um, in, in, in AMO where we are trying to quantify how much spinning reserve that we need. So basically how much primary response that we need. So we can plug in some numbers here of the load, the inertia, the contingency size, and we can try and optimize the amount of um, uh, primary response that, that we require. So this is sort of the last slide. Low inertia is not the only issue that we're facing here. As we're getting towards 100% um, you know, synchronous, non-synchronous generation, uh, we actually have a whole set of emerging issues that are occurring. So, you know, 0 to 30%, which is, um, we're, we're above that now, to be fair. And so that was business as usual, but now we're sort of in the 40 to 50 odd percent range instantaneously of having non-synchronous generation. And, and that's sort of the, the area of low inertia and um, that has an impact on, on our operating reserves. So how we manage the system is we basically add more spinning reserve, we uh, have more load following, we do all those kinds of things. However, as we, as we increase that and we go up towards you know, 60 to 100 percent, there are actually other emerging issues that come up. So system strength is an issue. System strength is really about um, short circuit capacity uh, at, at any point in the network. And if you are starting to replace, or we rather are starting to replace synchronous machines, which have lots of short circuit power with inverters, which are all current limited and they, they don't produce that much, then all of a sudden we have lower system strength. Protection devices may not work. Uh, we may have need to make them work prop better. Uh, we also have voltage instability as a result of that. Um, so that's an issue that's coming up. The other issue is uh, small signal stability issues. And, and this is something that we're starting to see a bit more of in, in the eastern states. So this is basically uh, controllers of wind and solar farms fighting each other. And, and this is what's happening over east. Is there's, there's a wind farm and there's a solar farm that's located nearby. And they're actually sort of acting against each other. And they, uh, AMO actually has had to constrain off some of the solar farm during certain times of the day uh, because of the adverse interactions between the, these machines. Now, we used to kind of have that in, in the uh, 
in the small signal um, problems in the synchronous machine days, but you know, a lot of those issues got resolved. So presumably we'll come up with sort of methods to quantify and resolve those issues as well going forward. Um, this is my final point. I think AMO's role here is we have no horse in this race, so uh, I think our role is really to support and manage the transition. I think it's going to happen. It's almost inevitable that we are going that way, the economics are stacking up that way, and um, trying to do it in a hopefully an orderly fashion. Yeah, so hopefully no blackouts in, in, that, in that time. I shouldn't probably say that, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, time for questions. Len. Um, the battery in South Australia, has that been contributing to the stability of the grid, uh, Eastern States grid system? It has, it has. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the time when there was this lightning strike on the uh, Queensland interconnector. It took out, it actually ended up separating all the systems. The Hornsdale battery really did put in um, in that time. There's a report um, basically talking about how it did contribute to frequency response in that time. So yeah, it's fast. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the technologies like uh, do, uh, uh, virtual power plants and uh, microgrids can address this problem. Yeah. And the technology more or less there. Mm. So what are the constraints of building them up? What is the what are the constraints from grid perspective of? Uh, there's nothing technical that's, that's preventing. It's really more um, regulatory and policy. I mean, there's no incentives to have that um, set up. Yeah. In place at the moment. I think that's what um, the reform process is supposed to uh, basically address is that to build, to, to put those incentives in place. Because right now you could do that, you could help the system, but you ain't gonna, you're not going to get paid for it. And so mm -hmm. um, I don't think that, that, that needs to be there. All those signals need to be there in order for uh, to unlock all these technologies. That's my opinion, anyway. Yeah. Is there one, no payment mechanism for the auxiliary services? There is at a large scale, and not, yeah, for, but, yeah, but not for a household doing it, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes. With uh, solar systems, provided that the inverter, uh, you know, maybe has excess uh, capability to, to uh, generate above its rated uh, wattage, um, what happens if you drop extra load on a solar system beyond its rated capacity for a short time? How, how does it respond? The voltage it... will go down on uh, your end and you'll probably end up just uh that'll just drop out, the inverter will just stop working at some point. I mean, uh, the, the, the equivalent of inertia in, a D, in, in these inertial systems is, is your voltage at your DC side, and so that's the thing that, that keeps it up. And so if you put too much load on the voltage, it will just go down, yeah, without anything else to support it, that is, yeah. So it can't briefly generate more power than it's raises? Well, possibly could, but I mean, yeah, it's, um, it's one of these things where I, I'm not even sure you could even do that. I have to think about that. Because I know that they operate on a voltage. Uh, yeah, exactly. Curve. Yeah, because you're uh, getting I that. Whether from it would go to a different part of the curve where maybe temporarily it can can actually generate more power and therefore. You know, well, you're already on the maximum power point generally. Well, speaking. that's the question. Yeah, so is I don't is think it you can, always yeah. operating on maximum? Well, presumably yes, because you're tracking it. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, you know, just come in here. Uh, uh, AMO and, and PUO are working on this DER roadmap and one of the recent uh, consultation forums we had, this was discussed, and there's the concern is the ability to constrain down the inverters on, at times when there's uh, either frequency or uh, voltage issues in the, uh, at the premises, outside the premises. And so that then creates the problem. The, the, the inverters are already uh, programmed to be able to ramp down according to the latest AS4777 uh, and IEEE 1547, I think it is. Uh, but they need to be upgraded even more. There has to be more implementation of those constraints. But going further, one of the points made at the WA uh, Electricity Forum was that we need to be able to constrain them up as well. So to be able to provide the load when it's needed. So one solution for that would be to have the inverters during critical times of the day, particularly between 10 and 2 in the afternoon, when we have these issues, is to have the inverters fully loaded by uh, such things as optional loads as water heating, uh, that's the best one because it's a resistive load, or secondly, fuel pumps, such that if there's an event on the grid, you need to have power back in. You can switch it instantaneously. 
That technology is already available. That's if not cloudy. I'm sorry? If it's, if, if it's, if it's not cloudy. Yeah, correct. Is there a role for um, home storage in that as well? To be able to take up a load. Yes. Sure. I think it's a question. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Is there a role for home storage? Absolutely. So but the cheapest uh, storage you can have in your house is not lithium batteries. Lithium battery at Tesla Powerwall 2 will cost you 13, 14,000. But you put a water heater in, you'll absorb 10, 12 kilowatt hours a day. And the price of the water heater is, what, $1,500, $2,000 fully installed? So that's the cheapest form of storage. I'm actually thinking of increasing the amount of generation capacity that it's putting in, rather than, say, taking up the cost of the Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it would be great yeah. with that. Uh, yeah. It's a solution. Um, with increased uptake of solar on a cloudy day, you're seeing more events where uh, contingency is being triggered not by a trip of a generator, but a big cloud front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say that's a contingency because the time scales are different. Yep. So the contingency is really like zero seconds, right? This, these things occur in like minutes, five, six minutes. So uh, that's more of a problem for us with load following, having the enough reserves to, to follow the load with uh, our, with the GTs that are in, in place and so forth, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, look, that, that is a problem. <laughs> and and um, we, you know, AEMO has caught up on backup load following three times now, I think, in the last six months, and never before that. So, you know, this is an issue that's coming up. It was a serious problem today. It was 156 megawatts, I think it was. That was dropped. That yeah. was uh, dropped uh, at 10.45. And uh, you can see it on your inverter graphs if you go and look. <laughs> yes? Um, measurement of wind uh, inertia. So, obviously, you know, the rotating fixed speed machines have got a very tight tolerance and seems to be much they can give up. But, obviously, with wind with variable speed drive, they can draw it right down their speed. Yeah. Have you done any studies on that? And, yeah, and as a result, are any? Yeah, there's actually like quite a few papers that are already talking about that. I mean, as I said, I think it's just a control system change because all they've got to do is just re rejig it. Because right now, the way it works is that if there's a frequency event on the system, it just outputs cost and power. Um, so if you can change the control systems, you can do that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, there's no incentive though to do that right now. Have you looked at how much inertia is available through those? No, no, to be fair, no. What are your thoughts on the distributed demand response that you mentioned? Uh, you know, presumably households or any appliance, any loads will be able to respond in real time to drop load. Is that something that you would? Oh, I'd love to see that happen at a real time uh, level. Again, I think you need that a set of real-time incentives <coughs> in place because it has to be a voluntary um, sort of action, as in you have to sign up for it and you have the opportunity, you have the possibility that you're going to get knocked off every, you know, in this case, it's like once a month, so it might, might be a lot, I don't know. But technically speaking, um, if it's, if you, I think you're talking about being a fairly rapid response. Yeah. So it would have to be controlled by some mechanism, I think you guys talked about. Yep. Frequency or like you could do that in terms of home automation. You could definitely do that now. Yeah. The, the question is whether or not you even have the load. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Are you getting enough visibility of the inertia of a system when your solar in, uh, penetration is going higher and higher? Yeah. So right at the moment, we pretty much only measure generator inertia. So yeah, but yeah. if the solar component says in the range of 30, 40 percent, yeah, that's a big part which is unknown, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of load inertia we don't know about, yeah. No. Well, we, we do. We, I mean, after events, we basically measure it. But they, they actually they, they fluctuate quite a lot during the day and time and, and weeks and seasons or so. So it's hard to make any judgment on how much load inertia there is at any point in the time. Who's Chris about mandatory built-in contingency? So if you see a market for something going forward where if you have any generating capacity, you have to build in the contingency. So in a very simplistic manner, let's say you've got a small solar on the roof and you have to have a mini battery, like you must have a battery up to a certain amount, which will give a very small short shaft. Or going back to large, like a solar farm. So if you've got a contract from the government to you know, 10 megawatts or 100 megawatts, that there's no way you'll get a license to do that. 
do that unless you have a battery that will cover contingency for 10 seconds or an hour or whatever. Have you seen any market or generation going on that? that yeah, you, you'd like a firming type battery? Yeah, I mean, the, you gotta, uh, that's a, it's a good idea. The thing is, you've got to balance out the economic cost of it. Are you going to be able to attract people to invest in the market if you have something like that? Because that's an additional cost on developers. I, I suppose I'm not talking about going, like going to a full test of the rule or whatever we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. You know, like some just having, like, you know, all around the world, people just have, have whole solar systems running on car batteries or, or, <laughs> you know, or right over, you know, your yeah. right over your drill battery, you know. Um, it's a very small amount of power, but it can come on instantly. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I would like to see it. I just think it would be, my personal feeling is I think it would be unpalatable economically. To right. Can I make a comment on that? Sure, sure. Uh, Horizon Power had a problem like this, and they had a rule by which you would need to have batteries to smooth it out. Mm. And they had expected that there would be a lot of uptake and the problem would be addressed. But because of economic reasons, it really didn't catch on. So recently they are changing the rules and making it more relaxed. Mm. So there is a quite a high economic disincentive to do that, even though it is technically possible. Yeah, thanks for that. That's yeah, good to know. <laughs> yes. Um, speaking of power electronics on the generation side, but there's increasingly uh, implementation of variable speed drives at the large industrial level. Are you starting to see that as an impact? Obviously, it's going to reduce volume of currents, but are you also seeing that as the industrial system being affected too? Yeah, I mean. Um, we have a thing called load relief, right? So it, um, I think I've got some slides here. That I didn't mention this because it wasn't too relevant, but um, when there is an event, there is actually, when the frequency goes down, there's a tendency for loads to actually back off as well. And that's related to induction machines. So as they slow down, they, they draw less power. But yeah, as you say, you have more variable speed drives and power electronic connections um, in the system. And especially, and like, not just industrial, but at your home with the inverter, air conditioners, mm -hmm. then you, we, probably will expect the amount of load relief in the system to, to diminish over time. Yeah, so yeah, that is a, that's something we're looking at anyway, yeah, and trying to track. One more question? Yeah, is a totally off the wall thought, but if you had excess generators um, and you didn't actually power them, is it possible to use them, you know, drive them as a motor, cold, so you're not actually generating steam? At just letting them spin, uh, driving against just friction, that's all. Uh, but they're available as inertial uh, you know, to, to take over. Is that? Yeah, is that and that's, not, that's, that's not stupid at all. I mean, uh, quite a few gas t um, turbine uh, people are actually starting to do this where they have a GT or synchron mode or synchronous condenser mode where they basically decouple it and they just run it, let it spin, mm -hmm. and it's there, provides inertia, provides voltage support. Um, and that, that's a possible mode. I don't think you can really do it on a coal fire machine. I think you'd have to re decouple the whole turbine train on there. It'd be too much work, but uh, I, I don't know this for sure. I'm just Thanks. making it up. You see, that, uh, there is a program in the States uh, to repurpose uh, uh, large steam turbine generators to uh, operate synchronous condenser mode, which is exactly what you're talking about. These are very good uh, programs because they only cost two, three million dollars to reprovision them. And the five or the four uh, 50 megawatt units down at Muja, the A, could be brought up to Perth uh, and installed up here. They need to be close to load, so uh, they could be reprovisioned with new switch gear and a bit of control gear. And they provide a lot more reactive power compensation than their nameplate capacity would do if they were powered as a generator. So it's a big benefit. Uh, just following your comment, um, primary you know, reusing of this stuff is great because all the transformers and all the power grid lines and all the massive billion dollar infrastructure is already there. There's just a hollow shell of a building that's got all turbines in it, but everything else is there because so, so using them as synchronous uh, condensers is a, is a, is a no-brainer because you just you know, grease the bearings and away you go. There's <laughs> only logic in that, yeah. And they have very, you know, they're, they're brilliant for that because they have very low windage. You know, you mentioned friction. They don't have much friction because they're hydrogen cooled. So you just leave the hydrogen cooling system on there and you've got a nice uh, free running, uh, low loss system that contributes great. And it also contributes, if you, if you want to put in VAR control like stat VARs or uh, um, um, SVCs, 
uh, you don't have any contribution to system strength, but you do with a synchronous condenser. So it's actually a good, good plan to do it. I hope Synergy really take that one out. As you mentioned, the synchronous condenser would have to be moved closer to the load. Why is that? I mean, if, if the Horn scale battery can affect Queen, Queen's... Because, because seven, reactive power... Seven milliseconds. Because reactive power itself, uh, in a contribution as far as bar control, which is the biggest problem on the network, right? Is that, is that correct? It's uh, a it's bigger a, problem than inertia. Right yeah. So voltage control uh, through having too much bars in the system because of the losses, um, they, uh, they would provide that, that benefit, but close to load. So it's, it would be better to move them out of Muja and bring them up close, maybe put them in Quinano or somewhere, or, uh, install them where there are existing facilities that could be tied in. To be fair, Ian, I think we have the opposite problem of that, as in we don't have too much load, we have not enough. So we're, we, we're having a bar problem on the opposite direction. On well, the other direction? Absorption, yeah, so oh, actually okay. putting in mergers on the bat. The oh, well, there's a, be there's a business yeah. from you, there. <laughs> <laughs> put that on the list. Yeah. And just to ask, like, uh, in the load of forecasting, I you know, we'll use uh, half hourly uh, load. Is that load actually calculation linked to this, this uh, initial load as well? Oh, it will be, yeah, over yeah. time. Yeah, that's right. That, that's yeah. what we're, yeah. we're trying to link it up so it becomes real time. Yeah, yeah you can some hard on years, five minutes average. So yeah, we use like a, uh, the real time value. Rather, um, yeah. we could use certainly use the forecast value as well. I just wonder how how to link those uh, historical observations to to these issues. How to link them? Yeah. Oh, just through the metrics, which is the forecasting, or through the SCADA data. I'm not sure your the thrust of your question. Yeah, we we basically pull out from the SCADA system. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Well, I think over time we will be disconnected from Western Power. We'll have our own pie. We'll have some APIs and so forth. So, I think uh, yeah, that 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 problem will be solved. Yeah. Just uh, not clear about how how these things linked together. Yeah. You mentioned uh, one of your comments about uh, uh, the East Coast with the wind farm and the solar farm having poor interaction. You, know, mm. you spoke of earlier. You know, obviously, the obviously, synchronous machines in the early days used to hunt between each other. Mm. Is that a similar sort of effect you're seeing? In that East Coast yeah, yeah. So it literally, like, whereas in synchronous machines they, they used to be natural modes of oscillation and they'd actually just uh, interact with each other in, in different areas and so forth. This is actually control system variables that are just interacting with each other in, in adverse ways. So it's similar but slightly different. Yeah. If you, yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you just clarify the the synchronous condensers? Uh, are spinning all the time. Uh, a, where do they get their energy from? And B, how much energy does it take to keep them going? Yeah, they're actually just synchronous motors with no load. So they're getting it from the grid. But you, to, to spin it up, it takes a bit of energy. But then to keep it spinning, it uh, doesn't take that much energy. In other words, if it's a, if it's a 35 uh, megawatt generator, yep. uh, once it's up to speed, Yep. It's not going to be drawing 35 megawatts. It's not, no, it's drawing like 0 0.1 or something, whatever. It is just to, to spin it around, yeah, just for friction losses. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Would seem to me the opportunity here is to have diversity and then use our technology now, like we have machine learning and different things, so we map out, like we get rid of the big grid, maybe, maybe run 30% of the supply on a major grid. And then we have a, a thousand little units. You could have coal in one spot and gas in another, just running smaller program with your solar, wind, and, and just have whatever suited to each area. But get as much diversity and small business as you can, type of thing, with the intelligence we've got with our IT to anticipate things. And, Mitigate the drop. Oh, I take your comment, but I must be aware I work for the grid operators, so I find that slightly unpalatable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, well, no, but yeah, that's a possible future. Yeah. That's it, that's it. Yeah. So, okay. what, is, what is the lowest level of inertia before you lose the sleep in the Swiss? 
Yeah, so a post, post contingent <laughs> thing, yeah, post contingent, I'd yeah, say post. around the uh, 6,000, 5,000, 6,000 mark, I think we'd, we'd be starting to. Yes, as we move into the, um, into the far future, I, I expect that our generating units would become smaller because we'll be talking about wind turbines and elements of solar farms and the like. Uh, that would imply that we would need less contingency reserve because each generating unit is smaller, so a failure of one of them is a smaller backup system. Have you, have you looked at, the, um, at what it might mean when, as we approach, say, 80 or 90 percent renewable penetration? We haven't looked that far. I mean, we're an operational unit, so we don't look yeah. that far ahead. But um, yeah, I, I take the point. It's a really good point as well. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the generation that we have right now was built at a time when we thought load was going to keep going up. So yeah, it's mm. you know, they're, they're, they're some costs. Yeah. Just yes. another question on far, you know, more sort of out there. Um, one of the things I've in my mind is really all substations around the place. We're talking about the microgrids. Can you see a future where the, the actual substation, you know, voltage drop, power drop throughout the whole grid, that the actual network becomes more of an interconnector than uh, an actual amorphous grid with each of the districts rather than having a substation like having their own localised battery? And just then on the other side of it, the other part that's concerning me is, you mentioned load, um, there's competing forces of efficiency, uh, so as more and more equipment becomes more and more efficient, load will drop, and what's the effect of that going to have on the overall grid? It's just a bit of an out there question really. Yeah, look, that second question, don't know, but yeah, it's a, it's a good one. The first question, though, um, Western Power, you know, ha has thought about that, and that's one of their future uh, grid pathways is this sort of hub and spoke sort of grid uh, model where you have different, um, you know, centres that are then interconnected by the grid. I think that that's that's being thought about anyway as a future uh, grid scenario. So drip, driven from a battery type situation or? Oh, well, just in general. Yeah, yeah I was just thinking, yeah. is that, you know, convergence of the price of batteries coming down? Doug, do you want to elaborate? <laughs> yeah, just, um, so just to, to what Julia said, we have looked at Western Bar a lot of, you know, scenarios. Um, the one on the modular network, you know, where the, you know, there will be some, you know, like localised, probably like rural distribution networks that might be supplied by standalone power systems, microgrids, nanogrids. But we see the future of the grid you know, in terms of being supplied by bulk transmission and the large load centers. I think we see the standalone power systems affecting something like 3% of our customer base, mm -hmm. with the majority of the network still being transmission connected. And I think you know, when you look at the battery, you know, there are some instances where if you do go a disconnect from the grid on the, on the cloudy days, if you could run on cloudy days, you won't have enough power. From Sun and the solar panels to effectively have enough charge in your battery. So effectively, that's then the value of the grid, and also the value of the grid in other services as well. You know, telecoms and scatter comms. You know, remote metering as well, like charging your car as well, your vehicle. So it becomes then the added value, you know, additional value add services as well. Thanks, Dan. Any other questions? Yes, I think. Um, yeah, looking at the uh, microgrid situation uh, and your, your duck curve in the middle of the day and concern about solar PV input, uh, if you had microgrids, would it be possible to uh, alternately switch off different microgrids from feeding into the, the network uh, if you had a, a, had a problem? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think if you had a at the right incentives in place, you know, that there would be a lot more training going on in these these times if you had storage and so forth as well. Yeah. I mean that's the future I think. Okay. We done for questions, yeah, I think. Okay, thank you. Please uh, give you a nice <laughs>